So I've spoken at nearly 400 events, and you know what? The, the question I get asked the most, I'll just answer it right now. Somebody's going to ask the question. Now, don't ask me that question, please. Um, it's not relevant, and, and it depends on the context. So what's more important is how you persuade people in their mind and in their emotions to want to make a decision and want to move to act. That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few examples. And this, this example, I blurred out most of the, uh, the page, but what I, what I want to focus on is their business model is to get people to sign up for a monthly subscription service for uh, cosmetics and, and um, uh, jewelry and things like that. And, and uh, so I'm going to show you a simple test. This is actually a button test where we're looking at the words on the buttons. And I'm, I'm getting, uh, starting ver from a very simple place, and it's going to get much more sophisticated in a moment. But what we wanted to focus on is button text that would tie into uh, a persuasion message to understand what motivates them to act. And everyone knows that the submit button is the worst possible button, so it's an easy starting point, right? You never want to start a relationship by asking someone to submit to you. I mean, that's just a terrible experience. So, so we wanted to test one that, that ties into the brand, becoming a maven, or, or urgency, I want in. So I'm going to get you to take a look at the results. Now, this is not what we were expecting. Um, and it turns out that both of these have hurt their sales when we tested this. So what have we accomplished here? Well, we found two buttons that are worse than submit. So, so that's good. That's a starting point. Um, so fortunately, you know, testing is never complete. And even when we have a losing test, that's okay. We've, we've learned what not to do, and we can continue from there. And we, we've been testing a many, many different things for them and found some really powerful results. So um, that's why uh, you know, what we found most importantly is that best practices, the so-called best practices of design and UX and conversion and persuasion need to be questioned because a lot of them don't work. And a lot of them have never been tested. And if they have, they might be tested in one particular circumstance or situation. And so I'll, I can tell you which one worked better, I would, if you'd like. Do you want to find you know, the best button that worked? OK. I'll, I'll tell you at the end of the presentation. Uh, so you, you've heard about all of these words that are guaranteed to work, right? These words are powerful, the most powerful words in the English language. New, you should, because, right? And if you use these in your persuasion, maybe they'll work, maybe they won't, because it depends on your context. So what I'm going to show you are frameworks much more powerfully than lists of words that you can use to find the context that applies in your situation. Here's an example. I'm going to show you a few examples uh, today. This one is another actual uh, subscription model, very similar su subscription model, very different target audience. This one is geeks and gamers. And they're looking for a monthly shipment of surprise uh, stickers and t-shirts and squishy things and all kinds of stuff that they uh, love, apparently. And so they wanted to increase their subscribers and profit, this uh, particular company. But they also understood that they wanted to understand who their target audience is and what motivates them to buy. What are their motivational triggers? So is it the quality that they're getting in the products? Is it the fun aspect of it? Is it the mystery? Is it becoming part of a community, a social inclusion? What drives them to buy? And if we know that, can we increase their sales by playing into those triggers? How would we find that out? Well, you can talk to a few people, right? A lot of people do user research. If you do that, you might talk to three or four or five or 10 people. But does that represent all of your buyers? So here's another button test, simply to, to start looking at how these words work. So the first one is join now. And there's a reason that we use the words join now versus another uh, button that says select your plan. So you might think about why, what are these getting at? What are we actually testing here? What's the underlying driver behind it? When we tested this, we found that join now increased their sales slightly, select your plan decreased their sales by nearly 8%. Now you think select your plan is actually more clear, isn't it? Well. There's a theory behind all of this. We've been using a, a, a model uh, that was developed in Germany by uh, Dr. Uh, Hans Hausel at the Group Nymphenburg. 
try saying that five times fast. Um, but they are psychologists and consultants. They've got a team of 30 people, and they've been doing a lot of research into specifically marketing mental models and how the different types of personas and people are motivated to buy. And the reason we were testing those things is there were two aspects within this model. This is called the limbic model. Um, and, it, and through their research, they found that there are distinct types of people. Some people are more dominant and need to have control. Some people are more balanced and need to have inclusion with people. Others are more stimulant and need um, stimulation, fun. And so we're looking at two areas in particular, the functionality more towards the dominant side and the sociability more towards the balanced side and wanted to understand which of these two aspects that are sort of opposite ends of the spectrum were more close to this target audience. That's why we were testing those buttons. Join now, which is more sociability, or select your plan, which is more functionality. That'll give us a hint about why they're buying. Not just a button text, it's not just random words that we throw up there, but what's the underlying driver? So then this winner becomes a new control that we can then continue to test on, right? Because it's, it's a, a continuous process. Uh, and we test a new set of, of pages, one that combines join now with a more tangible headline. Very clear, a monthly box of Geek and Gamer Gear, which it sort of clarifies the previous headline. And then another one which boosts the level of social inclusion by adding social proof on top. I'm going to actually get you to, to start guessing some, some of of these winners, which one do you think won? So how many think the variation, well, first of all, A, the original one. Who's going for A as the winner? We got an A vote, all right, perfect. Who's going for B? Tying it together, okay, and C's. Yeah, social proof lovers, excellent. Okay, perfect. So you're right, you're learning something here. Social proof built on the insight that we gained about social inclusion and amped it up even further, and now we've got another repeat, uh, a reconfirmation of the driver that we're discovering about this target audience. Yeah, question? These, these buttons were the CTA joined now? The yeah, this copy was, we were testing the headlines in this case to find out which headline uh, combined with the button worked better. Yeah. So social proof combined with social inclusion worked. And now we can build on that insight. In fact, we continue to test many, many different things, amping it up even further with more social evidence. And in fact, bringing in images from, from their social media, from their Facebook, has continued to increase their sales every, every month, every, every time we're testing. So this is how we understand the mind and the, the really the, the motivational drivers. It's called the limbic system. The, the, the limbic model is called that because it's your lizard brain. It's the base system that drives your actions. And we know, this is a, an amazing sales trainer who taught me in my early uh, days in sales, that people make decisions emotionally. And then they'll defend their purchase rationally. And they'll tell you they made a rational decision, but they haven't. No purchase is ever done rationally. It's done at the emotional level. And so to understand your customer's emotions is to understand how to get them to act. That's what we're trying to discover. I'm going to show you a couple more examples. So this is a business called DMV.org. It's a brilliant business. All they do is publish information about the DMV. Right? They have a content site, thousands of pages, clarifying how the DMV works. I love it. And they're making uh, tons of money doing it. So when you search for car registrations, you get to their content page. And where they make money is by having an interrupt. So you're, you've arrived on the car registration in California page. Now they say, compare car insurance quotes. And they send you off to another page right, to compare providers and then go off. And, so they're an, an affiliate model. They get paid for sending leads to Geico and others. And so we've been working with them for actually uh, close to five years now, continuously optimizing all of their experiences. This was the second step in the funnel. And if you look at that, you might have some ideas about how they could improve that page. And I'll show you some, some thoughts that we had. So what do they need? Does it need a complete redesign? Do they need to pick some more anchoring text, some more important words, some powerful trigger words? Do they need to try some different price presentations? You could Google top conversion optimization tips, and you'll find all kinds of blog posts about it, right? Most of them from HubSpot, just full of garbage. 
Never been tested. So what you need to find out is what works in your context. They don't need this magic list. What they need is a method to continuously find out what motivates your customers to buy. See, the words that you use are not the words that your customers hear. They're not the words that they understand. They all have mental filters, right? You can, you've heard of the rose-colored glasses. Well, usually their glasses are not rose-colored. But they're, they're, they're distorting the words that you say based on all of the experiences they've had in their life, based on their psychographics and demographics and experiences with your brand and your competitors' brands. All of those things are changing the words so that you don't really know what they're hearing or reading or understanding. The only way to know that is to talk to them and then test and find out if it's actually resonating with them. So I'm going to show you some, a couple frameworks today, and this is one that we use every day to understand the mind of the customer and put ourselves into their shoes. It's called the lift model. How many have seen the lift model before? Anyone? A few of you? Yeah, I'm not in a traditional conversion optimization group here, so this is good. It's all new content for you. The lift model has become one of the most popular frameworks in optimization. Essentially, it shows the six conversion factors that are impacting your conversion rate right now. The core of it is the value proposition. Especially if you're on a sales page, if you're selling anything in your business, the value proposition, you probably have your own definition of it. I like to think of it as an equation that goes on in your prospect's mind between the perceived cost of taking action and the perceived benefits. If the benefits outweigh the cost, they'll have motivation to act. If it's the opposite, they'll bounce immediately. It doesn't matter what you do. You can say anything. It doesn't matter. All of the other factors simply enhance or detract from the value proposition. So we look at the relevance. How relevant is it to the, the, the button they just clicked on or the link they just clicked on or where they just arrived from or how relevant is it to their needs or their seasonality? The clarity of the presentation is the clarity of the imagery, the clarity of the communication, clarity of the eye flow, clarity of the call to action. And then factors that detract from uh, the value proposition, anxiety, anything that creates uncertainty in your prospect's mind about taking action. Or distraction, anything that redirects their attention from the primary message or the primary call to action, and then urgency. And you can actually test within each of these six factors to find out where you have elasticity in your target audience and where you can drill in more, like we saw with uh, the previous example. Once you find a hint that something's working, you can drill in even further and build on that insight. So we actually use this to analyze these experiences, thinking about uh, the DMV.org experience and identifying based on data where we're running into barriers and where we can, can test to improve. So I'll show you some of the things that, that uh, we found in practice our strategists all gather around and, and work together in these sessions uh, to identify all of the potential problems and then prioritize them using some frameworks. So we saw in the headline uh, a clarity point that the headline re repeats the previous step. It's not adding any value. It was the same as on the banner. Too many colors and gradient backgrounds in the header. And you know, this is a common thing. We find that designers, if you ask them to bring attention to something, often they'll do the opposite by adding embellishment and colors and things that actually create what we call cognitive load. And it reduces the reader's interest in actually reading the content. So they don't have as much space, mental capacity to understand the words you're using. All of these things we could, could be improved. And so we had already tested a whole bunch of, uh, of rounds of testing and had clarified and, and cleared up a lot of those problems. But I want to particularly show you a couple experiments that are really interesting when thinking about the words. So this was the control page a couple years in. And it says select providers to compare rates. You can see we've removed a lot of the bullet points we identified. We made the buttons a lot bigger so it's um, more interesting. Then we added some words, a subhead. Get rates in less than 15 minutes. It's creating a sense of urgency. Then a second one. The one you choose is up to you. And then another one. The one you choose is up to you with a dog telling you. I like that one. That was my idea. Um, so I'm going to get you to guess again. So how many think urgency was the winner? Variation A. Who's going for urgency? Urgency lovers. All right. Who's going for B? One you choose. Like four of you? Okay. Who's going for a lovability? Yeah, dog lovers out there. Excellent. All right. So when we tested this, which was fascinating, uh, most of you were wrong. 
19% increase in their revenue site-wide by adding that subhead. And what's fascinating here is that that is adding no value whatsoever. It says the one you choose is up to you. Of course it does. They're holding the mouse. Like, <laughs> who, who else makes the decision, right? But what it's doing is something very powerful psychologically. This is what we call a profitable aha moment. It's making them money and it's giving them an insight. These ideas come from a process that continuously generates an unending stream of these ideas, and I'll show you how. Um, this, this was actually came from a, a, a study done by Chris Carpenter at um, uh, Wisconsin University. He, he did a meta-analysis of, of all of these sales techniques, and what he found through thousands and thousands of sales pitches is that salespeople who use some version of the phrase the one you choose is up to you, or choose whichever one you want, or it's your choice, doubled their sales success rate. And so from this study, we thought, well, I wonder if this applies on, online. Could, th could this happen? Could this work in an online experience? And so we tried that, and it worked. Every month, there are hundreds of articles coming out. This area of research is so ripe right now. There's uh, neuromarketing studies. There's behavioral economics studies, persuasion psychology. And to stay on top of it gives us uh, this unending uh, stream of ideas that can be used in marketing and in persuasion, persuasional words. So when thinking about the Lyft model, what we're doing here actually with those words is reducing anxiety. It's no longer a sales pitch because now we're giving control to them, consciously saying it's your choice to make the decision and they're more likely to decide then.